Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening on National Public Radio or the Global Internet <coughs> Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind you of upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, tomorrow, Heather Whitestone, Miss America of 1995, will review her year so far as the first deaf Miss America and announce a new public uh, service initiative to promote early detection of deafness. On Thursday, February 23rd, Michael Heyman, Secretary of the Smithsonian, will present a speech entitled the future of the Smithsonian. And on Monday, February 27, Willem Koch, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, will address the press club here. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for the speaker, please write them on the cards at your table, pass them up, and I'll ask as many as time permits. I'd like to now introduce the head table. Stand briefly when your names are called, please. Uh, Sonia Ross of Associated Press, <laughs> Gary Martin, San Antonio Express News, Maria Riccio, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, Steve McGonigal, Dallas Morning News, Josette Shiner, Managing Editor, Washington Times, Bruce Katz, Chief of Staff to Secretary Cisneros, Peggy Roberson, National Desk Editor for Hearst Newspaper and the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Jean Nolan, Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Charles Thompson, Senior Producer, CBS News, 60 Minutes. Michelle Kay, Cox Newspapers. Guy Gugliotta, Washington Post. And Paul Nyland of Congressional Quarterly. Our guest speaker today is Henry Cisnero, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. <coughs> Secretary Cisnero is, a, is America's number one federal housing and community development official. His career has been that of a shooting star. A native of San Antonio, Texas, he began in public service as an administrative assistant in the San Antonio City Manager's Office. After graduating from Texas A&M with a master's degree in urban planning, he earned a, a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a PhD in public administration from George Washington University. In 1975, he was elected to the San Antonio City Council, and in 1981, he became the mayor of that city, the first Hispanic to head the government of a major U.S. city. In 1985, he attracted national attention when he was elected president of the National League of Cities. Upon coming to HUD, however, Secretary Cisneros found himself confronted with a formidable task. He inherited a department afflicted by a proliferation of programs encased in a tangle of red tape. The National Academy of Public Administration last summer found that the department suffered from an acute case of, quote, program overload, unquote. It recommended that HUD either slim down or fade away. President Clinton came to the same conclusion. After the Republican sweep of Congress last November, the president asked the secretary to justify HUD's existence or pull the plug. Secretary Cisneros responded. He proposed a formula described as, quote, part new federalism, part reinvented government, and part an appeal to the idea of preserving the only department in American government devoted to housing, cities, and the growing ranks of America's urban poor, unquote. We now invite him to tell us how he is going to save HUD from its enemies in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Carmen, thank you very much, members of the National Press Club, friends of housing and America's cities. Thank you for 
inviting me to this venerable podium. This is an important opportunity to discuss the challenges facing America's cities. But this being February the 14th, Valentine's Day, first things first. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you my wife, uh, Mary Alice, and to ask uh, an all-purpose utility player member of my staff to present her with uh, my Valentine's present for today. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Um, let me uh, also, if I may, take one more point of personal privilege, and that is to introduce to you, at least in mass, the wonderful team that uh, President Clinton uh, assigned to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am so proud of the teamwork, the uh, fellowship, and the sense of, 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 of common purpose that have characterized our work at HUD. Thanks uh, to all of you, and I'd like to uh, ask you to stand, please, and be recognized, all the members of the HUD team who are here. <laughs> we stand today at a historic moment for national urban policy. In the wake of last November's midterm elections, the most fundamental questions are being asked in American life about the proper role of the federal government, the extent of our national commitment to our cities and our responsibility to poor people. How much should we as a nation do to repair the fabric of our urban centers, which have been left behind by the changes of our economy? How much responsibility should we as a nation accept for housing the millions of poor and low-income Americans who live in these places? How large a role should the federal government play in comparison to, say, cities or states in dealing with these problems? What is the fundamental purpose of government in confronting these issues? Many long-standing assumptions about relationships between federal, local, and state governments and between public and private sectors at all levels of government are being challenged. President Clinton views this as, in many ways, healthy. People's minds are open to new ideas and new possibilities. And we have an opportunity to make a clean break from policies and programs that have failed us and produce just old problems that have beset America's cities. But the moment, so rich in opportunity, is also full of peril. There is danger that in our eagerness to rectify the mistakes of the past, we will ignore the constructive lessons the past has to teach us. There's grave, grave danger that in our haste to do something dramatic, we will do something destructive. At this moment, America stands poised between acting on a new understanding of our national responsibility to our urban centers or rejecting its responsibility altogether. We stand poised between renewal or rejection of a national commitment to help millions of people who struggle daily against tremendous odds to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves and their children. This acceptance of national responsibility, this national commitment, is the essence of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Today, we hear serious calls for the dissolution of HUD. Those who issue those calls say they simply want to cut government. What they're really talking about is giving up on America's cities. They've looked at our cities, they've seen the serious problems of our cities, and they say, nothing we've tried has worked. Let's wash our hands of the whole thing. There's nothing more we can do from here. They're drawing the wrong lessons from the past. But how can we draw the right lessons for the future? Well, for starters, I suggest we try standing in the shoes of the greatest leaders at similarly defining moments in American history. Stand on the steps of the United States Capitol with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and imagine the nation as he saw it on January 20th, 1937. On that day, in his second inaugural address, President Roosevelt said, I see one-third of a nation, ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. Imagine a nation of 130 million people with more than 40 million living in substandard housing or no housing at all. One out of every three breadwinners, unemployed or underemployed, and unable to put food on the table or clothes on their children's backs. President Roosevelt saw all this, and he said, 
It is not in despair that I paint this picture for you. I paint it for you in hope. Because the nation, seeing and understanding the injustice of it, proposes to paint it out. The nation, under Roosevelt, did just that. One of Roosevelt's New Deal initiatives was the Federal Housing Administrator, the Administration, which last year celebrated its 60th anniversary. FHA revolutionized housing finance, opening the doors of home ownership for the first time to average working people in communities across America. Try to imagine what life for most Americans would be like today if we'd not made that national commitment of home ownership 60 years ago. And today we hear calls for FHA's privatization, selling it to the private mortgage insurance companies who want an effective FHA stifled, yet who have never consistently helped lower income Americans attain home ownership as FHA has done in good times and in bad for 60 years. Stand on the floor of the United States Senate in the years immediately following World War II when a fierce political battle waged over national housing policy. And listen to the words of Mr. Republican, Senator Robert A. Taft. In 1946, on the eve of the elections that gave the Republican Party control of the Congress, Senator Taft said, I believe the government must see that every family has a minimum standard of shelter along with subsistence, medical care, and education. Senator Taft known as Mr. Republican, fought alongside Republic Democrats of his day for a national commitment to decent, affordable housing, which is the bedrock of healthy communities and the foundations of economic lift for families. The vision of Senator Taft and his bipartisan allies became a national commitment in the Housing Act of 1949, which President Truman signed into law. The law declared the general welfare and security of the nation require the realization as soon as possible of a decent home and a suitable living environment for every American. A decent home, a suitable living environment, a national commitment. Truman and Taft and others of their day looked at post-war America and saw a terrible housing shortage. They did not, need the, they did not blame the people who needed a hand up they made a bipartisan national commitment to help them. By contrast, today we hear voices spewing forth the flawed logic of social Darwinism, calling for government's withdrawal from the housing arena altogether, rejecting America's long tradition of steady, forward progress in favor of retrenchment and regression. Try to see America's cities through the eyes of President Lyndon Johnson on the eve of the terrible riots of the mid-1960s. In March 1965, in a message to Congress, President Johnson said, the modern city can be the most ruthless enemy of the good life, or it can be its servant. The choice is up to this generation of Americans. President Johnson went on to say, we want to build not just housing units, but neighborhoods. Not just to construct schools, but to educate children. Not just to raise incomes, but to create beauty and end the poisoning of our environment. In that year, 1965, with the strongest, strong support of the Congress, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development was born. The nation reaffirmed and strengthened its commitment to our communities and the people who live in them. It was a bipartisan commitment. Republicans like Senator George, a George Aiken of Vermont and Senator Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania joined Democrats in voting to establish the housing agency. Senator Jacob Javits, Republican of New York, said it at the time, the hallmark of this whole century will be the culture and development of the cities and the fact that millions of people in close relation to each other can live together in comfort and in happiness. A national, bipartisan commitment. In the intervening years, HUD has delivered on this commitment. The Federal Housing Administration has insured new mortgages and refinanced home loans for 23 million families. Millions of families have become homeowners for the first time simply because the federal government stood with them. More than seven million people have lived in public housing supported by HUD subsidies. And despite the troubling and very real images of public housing today, it has historically been a starting place for a better life. Just ask Congressman Lewis Stokes of Cleveland or Congressman Joe Moakley of Boston or Bill Cosby or Kenny Rogers or Whoopi Goldberg. Ask Isaiah Thomas or Aaron Neville, 
Evander Holyfield or Vernon Jordan, Juan Williams, Bob Georgine or Diana Ross. Nearly 12.5 million families and individuals, including millions of senior citizens and people with disabilities, have found affordable housing in privately owned, federally assisted rental developments. Disabled people able to move from the shadowy back rooms of their homes to independent living because HUD was there to help. Hundreds of communities, thousands of neighborhoods, tens of millions of people have benefited from HUD programs over the last three decades. The national commitment that was renewed and strengthened in 1965 has been honored in communities from border to border and coast to coast. Of course, the record has not been unblemished. Mistakes were made, serious mistakes of policy, and as we are now coming to see, mistakes of method. For too long, we concentrated poor minority families in high-rise public housing projects that turned into warehouses of poverty and despair. We subsidized private developments and then allowed them to fall into serious disrepair. We insisted that every single unit of public housing, vacant or not, had to be preserved even when it made more sense to tear them down. We piled program upon program, rule upon rule, regulation upon regulation, and enmeshed whole communities in webs of micromanagement. We've too often lost sight of simple, powerful truths, the core values and original principles that define what we at HUD believe. We believe that government can help poor people best by helping people help themselves. The bottom line of government efforts to help people should be a transition to a better life. Government assistance shouldn't be an ending point, but a starting point. The beginning of a dynamic forward movement that leads to self-sufficiency. The housing products that we make possible, homeless shelters, public housing, starter homes, are not final destinations. They're stepping stones on the road to life's advancements. That was the vision of FDR and Taft and Truman and Javits and Johnson. Government efforts to help people should free them to make choices about their lives. Housing assistance should not tie people to buildings. It should free them to choose housing the way most Americans make that choice, on the basis of schools and services and recreation and proximity to work and medical care and personal safety. Government efforts to help people should free them from the lethal grip of economic and social isolation. In Chicago, I met a mother, Arlita Jackson, who used to live in a place called Ida B. Wells on the grim high-rise public housing projects that march for miles along the south side of Chicago. Ms. Jackson told me she used to fear for her son's life every time he went outside to play. Every time she heard a car backfire, she'd rush to the window knowing that it was gunfire, fearing that her boy had been shot. A federally supported rent assistance program freed her to move from Ida B. Wells to a, a community called Hoffman Estates, a safe community, good jobs, good schools. Today she's self-supporting. She has a job at Ameritech, and her son Jason plays the flute in the school band. They're in the mainstream of American life now and moving toward a better future. We believe we can help people best when we help them help themselves. This we believe. We also believe in community, that this is where real change begins and takes hold and flourishes. I learned this fundamental truth in my own political maturation as a city council member and later mayor of San Antonio when I saw the Industrial Areas Foundation help the people of the city's poorest neighborhoods organize to rebuild their communities. They secured sewers, paved streets, sidewalks, parks, libraries, clinics, street lights and other improvements and because they fought for their own communities organizing they did the political heavy lifting themselves and their, and their communities are thriving today. In this job I've learned another side of the reality of community in America. I've learned firsthand the limits of large centralized bureaucracies. This is a huge nation. Its immense diversity thwarps, thwarts the capacity of large centralized government systems to respond to needs and manage problems. 
They're too varied from place to place. Large bureaucracies are just never supple enough to manage all the iterations and permutations of thousands of communities across America. It's not that federal officials are negligent or ill-willed. It's just that the country is too big to try to do it in centralized ways. This notion of federal versus local has been a tension in American politics for a long time. And I would argue that it will be a major fault line running through our politics for years to come. The impulse to centralize in big bureaucracies versus our willingness to trust in communities. In sociological terms, it's a tension between dependence or independence, passive clients or engaged citizens, between looking to Washington or looking to each other, between devotion to set piece, one size fits all solutions, or an openness to innovation and eclectic ideas. In political terms, a convergence of thought on the left and right is emerging on this tension. On the left side of the spectrum, community organizers like Ernie Cortez of the Industrial Areas Foundation and the light Saul Alinsky tell us that we must follow what they call the iron rule of community organizing. Never do for someone what they can do for themselves. Organizers street smart on the left. On the right, conservative philosopher Michael Novak draws on the 18th century writings of Edmund Burke to draw our attention to the importance of, quote, the institutions of civil society, especially those of neighborly community life. The little platoons that make life human, teach the required social virtues, and supply the necessary moral inspirations and constraints. These ideas from left and right converge in community. They converge in places like Newark, where the New Communities Corporation has brought jobs and housing and hope to thousands of people. They converge in Philadelphia, where the ACORN organization is working with the Delaware Valley Mortgage Company to help low-income families become homeowners. They converge in our, in President Clinton's, empowerment zones, where the federal government has joined community-based nonprofit organizations, private businesses, and local governments to help residents lift themselves. This, we believe, is the heart of community building. We also believe the federal government must protect Americans when the injustices of local custom and the white-hot heat of local politics threaten to consume their most fundamental rights. This has been the federal government's historic role, and it has been a source of tension in national life throughout our history. That tension was evident in the Republic's founding. In the Federalist Papers, number 51, James Madison wrote, quote, in a free government, the security for civil rights must be in the same vein as security for religious rights. He continued, this view of the subject must particularly recommend a proper federal system to all sincere and considerate friends of Republican government. Justice is the end of government, he wrote. It is the end of civil society. It ever has been and ever will be pursued until it be obtained or until liberty is lost in the pursuit. That tension the federal role in national life brought on the darkest period of American life, the Civil War. When President Lincoln ended his, Gettysburg, his address at Gettysburg Cemetery, Cemetery with the immortal words that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, he was articulating far more than a poetic construction of language. He was affirming a theory of constitutional history argued by Daniel Webster against John Calhoun's states' rights concept, that the nation was but a sovereign, a league of sovereign states tied together by a contract, the Constitution. Webster argued instead in the 1830s, is it government, the creature of the state legislatures, or the creature of the people? It is, sir, the people's constitution, the people's government made for the people, made by the people, and answerable to the people. We're here to administer a constitution emanating immediately from the people and entrusted to, the, to them, by them, to our administration. It is not the creature of the state governments, he wrote. That tension between state prerogative and overarching national purpose has reverberated in our time most sharply in the struggle over civil rights. It burst onto the front pages of our newspapers and TV screens when President Eisenhower sent federal troops to Central High School 
in Little Rock. It flashed across our television screens when President Kennedy sent troops to Mississippi. Martin Luther King spoke to this tension in 1963 when he said from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream that one day in the state of Alabama whose governor's lips are presently dripping with the words of interposition and nullification will be transformed into a situation where little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and girls and walk together as brothers and sisters. Interposition and nullification. For 150 years, these ideas framed the debate about the respective roles of the federal government and the states in the most human and profound ways. Today, the interplay between constitutional roles and civil rights still courses through our national life. Communities throughout America are divided by race. Too many African Americans and other minorities remain cut off from the nation's prosperity. They're not cut off by choice. They're cut off by lack of choice. More than a quarter century after the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which declared that discrimination in home sales and residential property rentals must end, minority home buyers and renters routinely face discrimination. Single race neighborhoods endure. The laws promise that no one in this country, no one would ever again be denied access to housing because of his race or religion or national origin remains unfulfilled. Lower income and even middle income and upper income African Americans and Hispanics remain isolated, segregated, because they cannot live where they choose, even if they can afford it. This discrimination is abhorrent to our most fundamental notions of justice and equality. But these fundamental American values cannot prevail unless the federal government stands resolutely for the rights of people. The federal government cannot retreat from its historic role of protecting fundamental individual rights from local infringement. This we believe. Helping people help themselves, the primacy of community, guaranteeing and promoting real choice and protection of rights. We believe strongly in these things. But it's not enough merely to believe in principles. We must bridge the gap between belief and action. And that requires beliefs to be translated into operative values. Quintessential American themes, the nation, fair play, justice for all, opportunity, hopefulness, children and families, decency and respect for norms and civil behavior, reductions of violence and crime, less overt segmentation of Americans by class and political groupings, entrepreneurial government, smaller scale responses, reliance on local solutions. To cross this bridge from belief to action, the federal government must change and HUD must be the first to change. We've proposed to consolidate 60 major separately funded programs into three flexible funds that make the federal government a partner and an investor in our communities, not a prescriber or an intruder. We'll help communities build the kinds of local institutions that make room for people to lift themselves. We will no, no longer tell communities, you built elderly housing or disabled housing, or you can build a single room occupancy facility of the homeless, because that's the, what we're allocating the money to you for. Instead, we'll say, here are the res resources based on your needs. You decide how to deploy them. We'll also say that we want you to work within broad standards to which you must adhere, targeting low-income families or adherence to civil rights. This is responsible devolution of authority. And it's a shame that in today's superheated partisan atmosphere, even those who have been calling for this kind of devolution cannot support it because the partisan environment doesn't allow it. They want us to go further, they say, to unfettered devolution. But there isn't a week that goes by that the HUD Office of Inspector General doesn't inform me uh, about having to intervene in some community because federal funds have been misdirected or mismanaged. So we can't become just a check writing operation. We seek a real partnership with cities and states to meet national goals. And implicit in that concept of partnership is the devolution of authority with responsibility. We've proposed to transform FHA from a slow-moving bureaucracy into an innovative entrepreneurial government-owned corporation. Now, there are some who say we haven't gone far enough. They want us to sell FHA off entirely to the private sector. But look at what FHA does today. 
FHA insures one out of every six new homes. First-time home buyers account for 65% of FHA's home purchase borrowers, and more than 30% of all first-time home buyers in America are FHA clients. FHA insured two and a half times as many loans to African Americans as all the private mortgage insurance companies in the country put together. And what would happen if FHA were privatized as those whose voices call for privatization would, would seek? It is estimated that some 230,000 to 300,000 mortgages would not be made at all if there were no longer a full federal insurance program. If FHA were eliminated, the national home ownership would decline from the present 65.5% to 64% by the year 2000, instead of rising as we believe it can and should. As a government-owned corporation answering to the American people, FHA will serve a vital public purpose, expanding home ownership. And lobbyists for private insurers are making the rounds on Capitol Hill today telling legislators that FHA is competing with them and cutting into their business. Well, the fact is that when times are good, they want some of the business. But when times are not so good, you're not going to find GE Mortgage Company or MGIC Investment Corporation looking for ways to help lower, in lower income working families become homeowners. You won't see them lobbying to help poor people and minorities, but you'll find FHA on the Hill. Finally, we've proposed to radically transform public housing in our country. It's a simple fact that most Americans equate the worst of public housing with all public housing and with all of HUD. That equation is unfortunately too true in many large cities where the legacy of the federal involvement has been literally acres of deteriorated buildings, declining infrastructure, and wasted lives. High-rise apartment buildings that may have made sense in an earlier, more innocent age are out of sync in an era of crack and gangs and family dissolution and guns. The root of our current problems are deep and structural. Change must be equally comprehensive. Where the current system funds bureaucracies, we want to fund people. Where the current system gives public housing agencies capital and opera operating subsidies to maintain projects, we would give families rental vouchers that they could use in public housing or private apartments of their own choice. Where the current system relies on a complex array of rules and regulations to oversee the performance of agencies, we would rely on families to decide for themselves whether management has performed. For the first time in 60 years, public housing residents will enjoy the same privilege that the rest of us have, the freedom to choose where they want to live. If they don't like the housing that's offered by the housing authorities, they'll be able to move. And housing agencies will have to compete for their business, just like private landlords. Well, all of these changes, the change of consolidation, the change to a corporate FHA, and the change in public housing rules must be reflected in our budget as well. I have serious concerns that congressional budget actions may not follow these values, that budget cutters will follow a different kind of strategy, a strategy that says cut 30% or 40% across the board in a zeal to balance the budget. But there are limits on how far we can go before reductions in federal housing spending cut at the very social fabric of America's communities. Our programs serve low-income families and communities that are, are, that are already at the edge. We can't fray the safety net and then cut the very programs that are designed to help people move to economic opportunity. We cannot pursue policies that could literally place hundreds of thousands of our most vulnerable cities at the risk of displacement and homelessness. In the two years that I have been HUD secretary, President Clinton gave me a great honor to serve in this position. I visited over a hundred cities in America and everywhere I've gone, large and small, I've seen communities in crisis. I've seen abandoned buildings and vacant lots where thriving industrial districts once stood. I've seen young men standing on street corners in the middle of the day because there was no work. I've seen young teenage boys grab with life or death decisions. Which gang they should join? Make the wrong choice and you're dead at 14 or 15. Have we become so satisfied with the state of our union in 1995 that we can tolerate the idea of abandoning young people to awful choices like this? 
Our young people should be picking up a book or a band instrument, not a gun. They should be joining the football team or the drama society, not a gang. On the brink of the 21st century, we cannot, we dare not walk away from these young people. I, for one, do not believe that when the American people voted on November the 8th, they were saying that we should walk away from young people who are born into a world where the odds are so heavily stacked against them. I don't believe they were voting to abandon yet another generation of young people to horrible choices that no one of any age should have to make. I don't believe they were voting for economic decay and unemployment without end for people who live in our troubled urban areas. And I don't believe they were voting to push more men, women, and children into the streets to join the 600,000 Americans who on any given night are homeless. At this historic moment, when we've been liberated to question old assumptions and challenge old ways of doing things, we must seize the opportunity we've been given to change. Today, we need more than ever the vision of a civil, compassionate society articulated by Robert Kennedy 27 years ago. On the night Reverend Martin Luther King was killed. Standing on a flatbed truck in Indianapolis, Senator Kennedy sought to ease the despair and quell the anger of the moment. And he appealed to America's fears for the future and hopes for a better future with these words. Senator Kennedy said, what we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. So I shall ask you tonight to return home, he said, to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King, but more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love, a prayer for understanding and that compassion of which I spoke. We can do well in this country, he said. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past. We'll have difficult times in the future. This is not the end of violence. It's not the end of lawlessness. It's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the life of our quality of life of our land, and want justice for all human beings who abide in our land. So let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago to tame the savageness of man and to make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. In 1995, let us remember the gentle, hopeful words of Robert F. Kennedy, spoken on that grim night in April of 1968. And let us reject the cold words of those who would divide us anew. In this historic moment, let us remember who we are. And let us rededicate ourselves once more to the vision of, to the vision of an America espoused over the generations by our greatest leaders. From James Madison to Abraham Lincoln, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Robert F. Kennedy. It is a vision of a compassionate nation with room for everyone with a heart so big that even those among us most humbled by chance and circumstance can aspire to the greatest dreams. Thank you very much for allowing me to come over and be with you today. Thank you. Now comes the hard part. All right, good. Are you ready? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now comes the hard part, the questions from the audience. Why do you share the view that state and local governments can do a better job than the federal government in housing the poor? Isn't the failure of state and local governments in housing its citizens the reason that HUD was formed in the first place? I've tried to articulate in my remarks why it is that local communities closer to the problem, more directly related to people, can coordinate local plans and respond. And why it is that federal agencies 
distant as they are, prone to bureaucratic tendencies, have such a difficult time. This really is not stark choices, but sophisticated and intelligent partnership that must be fashioned. It's a partnership where the federal government brings resources because it is the level of government that has access to the most efficient revenue raising methodologies and puts them in place for, uh, for, for local government to be able to use. We think, generally speaking, that innovation, creativity at the local level, people who are closest to the problem, people who are uh, in touch and regular contact with local leaders can do a better job of putting together responses. One of the things I think we've learned over the course of the last decade is just how much innovation, how much uh, creativity, how much energy, how many different configurations and models exist at the local level when resources are made available. In this day and time, Americans simply have less patience with huge bureaucratic organizations attempting to do this work. It has always been a partnership. We've gotten the partnership slightly out of balance, I think, it, it, by relying on the federal government and its tendency to build these huge structures. And now what we must do is let the different elements of the system do what they do best. The federal government has resource capacities. The state and local governments can create organizations. Nonprofits and private groups have unique incentives. Each of us has a role to play. What we must do is strike the partnership correctly. Is switching from federally subsidized housing to a voucher system really going to work? Even if you give a poor family a voucher, where would they find affordable housing since there is a nationwide shortage of private multifamily housing for poor and moderate income families? First of all, vouchers do work. We've had a 25 year experience with the program called Section 8 which has been one of the most successful and popular programs ever put in place by the federal government. If you ask most families who are presently living in public housing whether they would rather have the certificate to be able to search for housing, most will tell you that they would li like to have the certificate. Our analysis tells us that something like 81% of all families with certificates nationally have a, make a successful match with housing. 81% go to completion and end up with housing nationally. And our analysis reflect that upwards of 45%, in some cases 50%, of the housing in a given community is available for persons with Section 8 certificates. That is to say, they can make the match of price and what the certificate will afford. Now, we're not so naive to believe that discrimination doesn't continue to be a factor. It does. Uh, that there are instances of very tight housing markets where apartments dry up and there simply are none available. That is also true. But by and large, the voucher program has worked. And as between keeping people in the present conditions that they're in, out of slavish loyalty to the bureaucracies, the monopoly of the housing authorities, or giving people choice, it really is a, a, a pretty easy call. Uh, just, just imagine uh, placing yourself for a moment in the position of a, of a person in public housing who is at the uh, top of a wait list after three or four years of waiting and then has to take whatever assignment there is of vacant public housing at that time. In other words, when they come up to the top of the waiting list, whatever is vacant is where they must go. And if they choose not to go there, then the normal practice is to go back to the bottom of the waiting list. So it's another three or four year wait for housing. There's no other American that has that little choice about housing. So we must move to a system where we give people more choice and we think the system is the way to do it. On your proposal for consolidating into block grants, what happens when the money goes to states or localities that have entirely different priorities than the federal government. Well, the, it is, of course, again, we have a long record with block, block grant programs. Um, uh, the Community Development Block Grants just uh, celebrated its uh, 20th uh, birthday last year. Uh, so there's a long history of working with communities. By and large, we find that communities use the program 
uh, for the intended purposes. It will be necessary to stipulate both in law and in regulation that we intend the programs to be used for persons of low income, targeting effects, uh, with financial safeguards uh, for financial accounting and so forth, and uh, to meet national objectives, such as uh, addressing vulnerable populations, the homeless, the disabled, the elderly, Native Americans, people with special housing needs, for example, uh, and civil rights issues. Uh, admittedly, we will have to advance the state of the art of monitoring, but the experience of the last 20 years has been a good one. Let me say finally that the President has made it very clear, and the Budget Director, Alice Rivlin, uh, as well, that these will not be block grants in the form of uh, check writing operation where we simply send a check and tell a community, tell a community that they may use it as uh, revenue sharing uh, to offset local deficits, to cut local taxes. Uh, this is designed for low income targeting, for particular populations and particular needs. And uh, I believe the monitoring uh, will allow that to occur. These will be called performance-based grants because they will be based on local plans that stipulate local problems and then measure their ability to address those problems at the community level. So it's, 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 quite a, it's, it's a generational step beyond block grants to performance, tied to performance. And for those of you who are students of government, you may want to study what Oregon is doing in the very sophisticated effort to benchmark particular community goals, performance standards. I think that's the direction we want to move in uh, in terms of this partnership for the long run. I'm, I'm confident that most of the monitoring issues can be addressed as we go forward. As an alternative to subsidized housing projects or other forms of subsidy, why not just give poor people income support and encourage them to leave the ghetto and move to places where jobs and housing exist. Well, housing certificates are essentially that. Uh, they are not cashing out in the way some would want and mixing with food stamps, welfare, and so forth, uh, because most of the plans that I have seen for that reduce the amount of money below the levels at which people could sustain themselves. In other words, unlike other forms of assistance, uh, housing has a discrete cost. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, kind of a, uh, an area-wide average, if you will, or, or a contour of what rents might be. So if we're not helping people at that level, we're not helping them very much at all. Instead, we're simply creating an impetus for the creation of new slums. Housing is different than other forms of assistance. It warrants a, a certificate for that purpose, but the certificate that we have proposed accomplishes precisely what the questioner suggests giving people ultimate choice, able to find housing wherever they want in a metropolitan area. Uh, we, we think it is important to stop short of the next step, which is to simply throw the housing dollars in with welfare reform, food stamps, and everything else, uh, because we would lose the ability to focus on housing and housing strategies. Vouchers, block grants, smaller federal government, are you sure you aren't a Republican? I'm quite sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite sure. Uh, look, I, let me just say, I think that the uh, traditional uh, measuring stick has changed. What we're talking about here is a different paradigm. The, 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 the issue of whether or not we ought to do things in a centralized way or with communities is not Democratic or Republican. It's been associated that way, I suppose, by some over the last number of years. But there are deeper shifts going on in American society, some of them dictated by our technology. I've referred to them on, uh, on occasion as a kind of a new sociology loosed in America. Uh, and, and I think that fundamentally the fault lines are going to be uh, what people believe about the role of government. I believe there is an important role for government. Where we argue consolidation to achieve national objectives, members of the new leadership in the Congress argue unfettered devolution and cut the money. Where we argue uh, an FHA that is a government-owned corporation achieving the efficiencies of a corporate environment but 
with a public purpose objective in the marketplace, the leaders of the new Congress would say, sell it off to the private sector. Where we argue for vouchers as a way to give people choice, they would argue that the government has no place in the housing arena at all. I think dramatic difference between what we believe and what the leaders of the new Congress are espousing. And that difference will be clearer as we see them put their mark on legislation, and it will be clearer as we see them put their mark on budgets. We believe in a role for the government. President Clinton has given us a budget that exceeds last year's budget because we have changed. His explicit message was, you change. You clean up this bureaucracy. You eliminate these inefficiencies, and we will fund you in a way where the money can really reach people and make a difference. Make the government work is very different from take it apart, dismantle it, and get out of the business. Has HUD, has HUD explored the possibility of converting decommissioned military bases into housing for the poor? If not, why not? We have several efforts underway now to use uh, decommissioned military facilities, or portions of facilities, I should say, appropriate facilities on military bases for the homeless. Uh, one that I'm particularly proud of is Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, where the community negotiated a strategy to use uh, decommissioned parts of the base for homeless families as well as a, a sharing plan to share the burden of homeless responsibilities for the metropolitan area as a whole. My hope is that we'll be able to go beyond homeless strategies and take advantage of some of the excellent housing that exists on military bases. If you look across the country, naval bases, air force bases, old army posts, they have wonderful non-commissioned officer housing and officer housing which can be made available to communities uh, to build or, or to, uh, to, to, uh, as affordable housing. Uh, and, and this is a, a relationship I think we need to strike with the Department of the Defense to try these models on a broader scale. We have a handful of instances now. We need to have dozens and dozens. This is a wonderful resource for the country and it ought to be put to use to house people. A number of questions on the Justice Department inquiry. Uh, Regardless of whether a pr special prosecutor is appointed, do you intend to remain in office through the end of the current administration? Is the inquiry hamp hampering your effectiveness? What are your plans? First of all, I am confident that a special prosecutor will not be necessary in this case. Uh, uh, we've been completely forthcoming uh, in, uh, with the investigation, and I fully expect that they will conclude that there was no wrongdoing. Uh, but uh, uh, no matter what the outcome of that decision at the Justice Department, it's my intent to continue to serve uh, as Secretary. Uh, clearly I serve at the pleasure of the President, and, and, uh, uh, but I, I hope that my work over the last months uh, has proven that I uh, have not spent an inordinate amount of time on this matter. I have focused on the reinvention of the Department, on our budget, on uh, larger issues of importance to the administration and have spent virtually no work time on this subject. I've got a good legal team, have a good legal team. Uh, they're focusing on it and I check signals with them every few days uh, by telephone. Uh, and so I'm confident that I can function uh, as secretary uh, even uh, should the inquiry go beyond the present step. Thank you. Before we get to the final question, I have a couple of gifts for you. Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you very much. For joining us. Coffee cup. Thank you. you can drink out of or collect money out of, whichever way you like. <laughs> Final question. Uh, question that says he enjoyed your, uh, he or she enjoyed your speech uh, very much and now asks uh, a couple of uh, questions about it. Please define interposition, nullification, devolution, and unfettered devolution. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for the question, because I spent until 11 o'clock last night studying that precise matter in anticipation. I have a, a, someone gave me a gift, a book called An American Reader. And uh, after I had looked up Madison number 51, which, to, to find that, that, that point about 
civil rights and religious rights and the role of the federal government. Um, and looked at Martin Luther King's speech, which I remembered the interposition and nullification quote, and have always known it related to the state's rights agenda. I went and looked through this American reader, and sure enough, Daniel Webster made a speech in 1830 on nullification. Uh, because the issue has really been with us that long, uh, since the founding of the Republic and throughout, the question of the relative positioning, federal and state, and the nullification. Nullification specifically means, and it was related to a Kentucky case, as I recall, when a state is unhappy with a federal decision, whether it can nullify it, and, 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 and the ultimate action is secession. Whether or not a state can go that far in expressing its unhappiness about federal action. Uh, and of course, the debate leading up to the Civil War was about the right of the states to secede. There's some fabulous writing on, 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 on the question uh, uh, of whether the issue was slavery actually first or preservation of the Union. And there's a lot of people who then were, were agnostic on the question of slavery who were absolutely certain that they wanted to defend the Union and so this whole concept of the right of the states and the right of the federal government has been with us for a very long time. What is devolution? Devolution means, <laughs> I took the question literally, I suppose, <laughs> it might have been a joke. <laughs> devolution means sending authority to lower levels in the system. We believe that's the appropriate thing to do, but with conditions, with stipulations, with concurrence about national objectives versus unfettered devolution, which is a term that was sent to me by a congressman in critique of our proposal, which said, in effect, just send the money. No conditions, no, uh, no strings, uh, no checks and says, I favor devolution, not unfettered devolution. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us. Thank you all for coming today and good afternoon.